beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to see and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Good morning, Clear Creek. Man, we are so glad that you're here with us this week. Uh, our sermon title this week is Just As I Ain't. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along, or you want to follow along on your iPad, iPod, whatever you've got in your lap, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 15 today. So if you, uh, you want to turn there and get ready, that's, that's where we're going to launch into in, in, in just a little while. Before that, you know, we have a way of always announcing new members and people who have been baptized and, and great events in the life of this church. Well, a great event in the life of this church happened this week, and that was Bill Braswell went home to be with the Lord. Uh, he had lived a life uh, of, of being a very humble, kind, Christian man. And it's graduation day for him. And, and that is just such an exciting thing. Uh, if you don't know Bill, he used to sit back here in the back. If you know Terry Gilbert and Brad Braswell, that's their dad. And, and uh, he's been a member of this church for 47 years. Pretty awesome guy. I, ho I hope that you did get a chance to, to meet him. But uh, we celebrate with him today. It's his first Lord's Day in heaven. That's pretty exciting. Also, in a couple of weeks, uh, we're going to finish up this, this sermon topic called Built Strong uh, next week. And the week after that is, is a great holiday, and you may not be aware of it, but in my list of holidays, there's Thanksgiving, Super Bowl Sunday, and Christmas. All right? In that order. So, in two weeks, we're having Super Bowl Sunday. My sermon is entitled, Grab Your Gear. And so I want to invite you to do something kind of fun where you can participate as, 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 as part of this, this group when we talk about Grab Your Gear. I encourage everyone here to wear your team jersey. Either, either your Boyd Buchanan, Hickson High School, Macaulay, if that's your jersey, Tennessee, uh, Alabama, Georgia, if necessary. Uh, <laughs> Whatever. Just come. It's going to be a very laid-back, relaxed atmosphere. Uh, wear your team jersey. It's going to be a fun day. We're going to talk about grab your gear, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Before we begin our lesson this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer. God, you are an awesome God, and the opportunity that we have this morning to worship you is one that we are so undeserving. And we come before you this morning so thankful that we can be here. There's a message that needs to be heard this morning and I pray that I don't mess it up. I pray that we all hear it and that we understand that it's coming from your word, it's coming inspired by your word. And Father, just strengthen us so that it'll change our hearts and change our minds. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Just as I ain't, I'm not like you. Don't do the things you want me to. For messed up life, check you know who, but to the church I come, I come. Just as I ain't religious not, the Bible you read to me's a blot. But the Christ you speak of I like a lot, so to the church I've come, I've come. <laughs>
God was one of us. Amen. He became a man just like us, flesh and blood, bone. He became like us in all things, yet without sin. And that's the message that we declare to people as the church. Now, now you see, last week I asked two questions because I told you that I'm one of those people who grew up in church. I didn't bathe in the baptistry, but I did sleep on the pews, as some of you will this morning. But the questions were this. What is church? Last week we talked about it. It's, it's, church is organic. It is this, this building that's not a building at all that never ends, and we continue to add stones, people, to this group, and we continue to attempt to align them with a the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. It, it's a movement. It's not a meeting. It, it, it's a mission it's not a ministry plan. It's not somewhere you go, and it's not something you do on Sunday morning. It's never an errand. The church is a revolution. It's an organic revolution, mouth to mouth, person to person, and we continue to grow and morph into a clearer image of who Jesus is. So what's the church? It's a movement. This morning, though, the question is this. Who's church for? Now, if you've been here the last several weeks, you've noticed that I keep using these boxes. I'll have these boxes still up here next week. We'll talk about them a little more. But these boxes represent the people in our community. And on a news report, it was, it was shared with the whole world on the night of the presidential election that 20% of Americans are churchgoers, so to speak, affiliated with the church, uh, which means that 80% are not. And if you dig into these, these statistics, you're going to find out that 20% are affiliated with the church. There's another group, and I'm not sure it's 20%, but they're, they're called de church They're people who used to be a part of the church, but they're no longer a part of the church because they feel it either lacks relevance or they've been hurt in some way. And then the rest of them, these boxes down here that don't have the stripes, those are people that are unchurched. They're people that really have never been uh, part of church, part of this, this family of God that we call the church. Now, here's what I've seen growing up, though. I told you I was raised in church, and, and I have uh, been a, a part of church my whole life. I have always been in this red box. Uh, as a matter of fact, the church that I grew up in, I was there the day they broke ground for the building, and my mother still has a picture of me holding a little shovel. I was there, one of the groundbreakers. I mean, I've been in church forever. But here's what I've seen out of church. Let me scoot this up where I can get behind it. You remember we talked about church, that our section of the church is the little green cup. This is about what it would feel here. But I've got another little green cup. And what we've done is we've created church that's for church people. Now you think about it. We've created an atmosphere that if you speak the insider language and you know what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to do it, you're going to feel very, very comfortable. If you don't, then you won't. And what we've done is we've taken people out of this church people and we'll put them in these church people. And, and what I've got in here, by the way, is trail mix. There's not a better description of church people than trail mix. You know, it's got nuts and flakes and what's not in there is kind of sweet. Um, and so what we do is we take, we take our church people and we, we move them over and, and we'll put them, and then we'll take people that are other church people, and because they're kind of associated with what's going on, they're going to move them over here too. We're going to put them in here. And then unfortunately, this is a different kind of trail mix. This is a trail mix that doesn't have anything sweet in it. And so some of these people get involved with a group that really is just nuts and flakes. And so they decide they don't want to be a part of any of this anymore, so they move over to here. The question is, is it's a matter of belonging. Where do you belong? Do you feel comfortable here? Do you feel like you belong here? Do you feel like you're welcome here? The problem arose in the book of Acts. Chapter 15, and we read verse 1. It says, Some people came from Judea and started teaching the Lord's followers that they could not be saved unless they were circumcised as Moses had taught. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of talk about circumcision and what that was all about. That was a covenant between God and the Jews. It had to do with reminding them of their racial purity. But now, Christianity had been opened for all mankind. The church was for everybody. 
And so Paul and Barnabas had gone on their missionary journeys. And at this particular place, you might even have in your version, that they were at Antioch. And while they were at Antioch, there were these people that had come from Judea. They were Jewish Christians and said, you can't be a Christian unless you become like us Jews in every way, including circumcision. This was a bigger issue. It wasn't just about surgery. It wasn't just about um, becoming Jewish. For the people who heard the message of the Judean Christians, it was about this. I thought I could belong, but you're telling me I don't. I, I thought Jesus was enough, but you're telling me there's all these other things that I got to do too. Or, or else I don't belong. Doesn't it feel good to know you belong? Doesn't it feel good to know that you matter? Doesn't it feel good to know that you can be a part of something bigger than yourself? And these Gentile Christians wanted to be a part of this revolution. They had heard the story of Jesus. And they believed every word of it. They staked their lives on it, and they were obedient to him. They were baptized in Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. And they were bebopping along, thinking everything was okay. And then they were told, you don't belong. Isn't that what we do sometimes? Church people? Isn't that what we do? You know, people are wanting to know about this Jesus. They don't really know much about the Bible, but they know the story. And they're living a life that they know it's messed up. We don't have to point that out to them. What we ought to be pointing out is we're messed up too. But they know about this Jesus and they want to belong. And the problem is, is we keep saying, well, yeah, you can belong, but. And that's what's happening in Acts chapter 15. The Judean Christians, yeah, you can belong, but. Here's a major hurdle we want to throw at you. If you look at verse 2, it tells us that Paul and Barnabas argued with them vehemently. I mean, this really caused a problem. And so what happened is Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem to meet with the elders in the church in Jerusalem. And what they found out in Jerusalem is they found out two very important things that we as the church need to remember. And I want to ask you to remember it this morning. When we start thinking about all those people in the black boxes and in the black and yellow striped boxes that we know, that are just as we ain't, they share these two things. First teaching point is, all people, all people are important to God. We, church, we must realize that all people are important to God. Do you have anyone in your life that you love so much that if they were not a part of your life anymore, that it would leave this vacuous, crater-sized hole in your heart. Do you, do you know anybody like that? My guess is most of the people in this room, there's at least one person in your life that if they weren't part of your life, you'd feel empty. You'd feel like there was something missing. That hole in your heart, love. But I've got good news for you this morning. And that is... Everyone in this room, there's somebody in this world that feels that way about you. More important, the one who created this world feels that way about you. It's good to know that. But what we also have to recognize is that the person sitting next to you, the person that you know, the one you see at the movie theater or the ballpark or at Panera Bread or at the coffee shop or wherever it is that you spend your time, and whatever it is you do when you're being you, God feels that way about them too. He, he, he looks at those people, the guy who is homeless on the street or the person who needs one more nickel to get that cup of coffee. 
He looks at those people, and you know how he feels about them? If they were missing from him, he'd have this hole in his heart. It was that hole in your heart kind of love. And everybody matters to God. Church of Jerusalem knew it. You know, Peter it was part of this church of Jerusalem. And, and you can go back and read Acts 10 on your own time. But there's a wonderful story there. He was at the house of Cornelius. And he was up on the roof. And, and he was getting tired. He fell into a trance. And he had this vision. And it was a vision. The Holy Spirit is, is showing him something. God himself speaking to Peter. And he lowers this sheet with all these animals on it that the Jews would consider to be unclean. You know, they weren't allowed to eat certain meats. They weren't allowed to eat certain foods. But all these foods come down. And God spoke to Peter and he said, slay and eat. And we know Peter. No, never has anything unclean ever crossed my lips. And God makes this statement. What I have made clean, don't you call unclean. The pictures of those people that don't look anything like us, what God has made clean, don't you call unclean. Why? Because they matter to God. And when we lose sight and lose focus on how much and how important people are to God, everybody is to God, then we will lose our zeal for evangelizing a community. When we forget how important people are to God, the people in the black box will no longer matter. James said this. You go down, I think it's verse 13 and 14. We've got it on the slide there. Uh, he says, when they finished, James spoke up after Paul and Barnabas had talked to him about what was going on. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon, who was Peter, has described to us how God first intervened to choose people for his name from the Gentiles. So they bring this problem. These people who say, you don't belong. Paul and Barnabas are saying, we do belong. What do you say? They're saying, everybody is important to God. I hope we don't ever forget that. I hope when we see people who are different from us, who are just as we ain't, that we remember that God has this hole in his heart love for them. I mean, it's such a powerful love that this world continues to turn because of it. That's what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3. He said, the Lord's not slow concerning his promise, but he's patient with us, wanting all to come to repentance. He wants people to come home. And he wants to use us in order to help that happen. He wants the people in the black box to find the red box. So, all people are important to God. Uh, the next thing I want you to see is that we have got to stop making it difficult for people to connect with God. Now, I've got two friends that are going to help me this morning. Their names are Grant and Bella. If Grant and Bella will come up here, uh, yeah, there they are. Come on up. You can come stand with me right here. I'm going to let you introduce yourself with your full name. Okay, you ready? I'm Bella Steele. Bella Steele. Grant Majors. Grant Majors. Now, what you may not know is Bella's name is Italian for beautiful. Did y'all know that? I bet Bella knew that. It's Italian for beautiful. And Grant's name is Greek for I'm awesome. <laughs> not really, but we'll just pretend that it is today. All right? Now, I've got to ask you a question. Do you like cookies? What's your favorite kind of cookie? Chocolate chips. Chocolate chip cookies. You like chocolate chip cookies? Mm hmm Do you believe that everybody should eat at least one chocolate chip cookie in their life? Yes. I think so, too. I think, would you like a chocolate chip cookie? I tell you what, I, this morning we have freshly baked some chocolate chip cookies. Check it out. I mean, fresh. They're good, too. I mean, these are really good. You want a cookie? Okay, I'll just reach up there and get you a cookie. Here you go. I got you a little plate. Just, here you go. Just reach up there and grab you a cookie. Go ahead. I mean, you can't climb on it. Uh-oh, we have a problem. Would y'all really like a cookie? Yes. Very good. What would happen... 
took these cookies. Sorry, come here. And I put them right here. Get you four cookies a piece. <laughs> one's for you, one's for your little brother, one's for mom, one's for dad. And I want to encourage you to do this. While you and your little brother are eating your mom and dad's cookie, just tell them how good it is. <laughs> okay? Thank y'all for helping me. Everybody give them a hand. Y'all go sit there. Thanks. Oh, I got to get the cookie out of my mouth. Anybody got any milk? Do you see what just happened? We've got the greatest story in the world. We've got the story of Jesus. You follow me so far? Here, here's someone that said, he was God. He loved us so much that he didn't want to live without us. And we want you to come into access to him, with him. We want you to be connected with him. The problem is, that's the cookie. And we continue to put the cookie up here. We make it difficult for people to connect with God because the way we do things is we say, we want you to connect with him, but we want you to dress like we dress. We want you to connect with him, but you have to agree with us on every point that we think about in the Bible. Now, we really would like for you to connect with him, but you have to understand our songs and our language and our insider lingo. And we continue to put, what we do is we take something that's really, really good and we move it up a shelf. Insider lingo. Agree with us on all matters. Dress and act like us until we get to the point where they can't reach the cookies. It is our responsibility as the Lord's church, as the family of God that is a movement, to stop making it difficult and put those cookies on the bottom shelf so people can get to them. You, you see, here's, here's what Peter, James, and the Holy Spirit said in this matter. What was happening was, is we had a group of people saying, the cookies are on the top shelf. You need to do things or you're not going to get to the cookies. Peter, James, and the Holy Spirit said this, verse 10. Peter says, now then, why do you put God to the test? By putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, why do you make them cross all these hurdles and put the cookies out of reach when we know good and well that we couldn't reach the cookies either? James says it this way, verse 19. James says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. He's saying, let's take the cookies off the top shelf and let's move them down. And what matters to God should matter to God. And what matters to us doesn't matter at all. Because when you're looking at people just as they ain't, Sometimes we have these prejudices and we have these ideas and we keep, continue putting those hurdles up there. And so when they answered the church and they sent a letter back to the church, this is what they wrote. The Holy Spirit, that's God by the way, the Holy Spirit has shown us that we should not place any extra burden on you. So church, should we stop making it hard? for people to come in contact and connection with God? Should we be willing to be open and accepting of people where they are so that we can lead them into a relationship of where they need to be? I hope so. But I want to leave you with this thought. It has to do with the whole concept of who we are. You see, when we're inviting people into the red box... We're not inviting them, hopefully, we're not inviting them to be affiliated with God. What we're inviting them to be is part of our family. You see, we're not inviting them to a building. We're not inviting them to a meeting. We're inviting them to a movement of the family of God. We're inviting them to be our brother and sister and friend. We're inviting them to lock arms with us so that no matter what happens in their life, they know that there's a place and there's a group of people and there's a gathering. You, if you were here last week, you remember me talking about the word church, which actually means gathering, congregation. There's a gathering that says you matter. You belong to me. 
You're my family. I, I want to show you a quick film clip. And, and when I show these film clips, by the way, I'm not endorsing the film or the t television show or any of that. Uh, this is a good film. If you can catch it on TV and edit it, it is called um, uh, Freedom Writers. It's about an English teacher named Erin Gruel who was sent to, it's a true story, that was sent to an inner city school and she was teaching uh, a group of ninth graders who were functionally illiterate, mixed race, poor, rival gang members. That's who was in her class. And she was wanting to teach them literature, but she ended up teaching them a whole lot more than that. This scene is the beginning of their junior year. They're doing a toast for change. One girl holds up her glass of sparkling apple cider and she declares, I want a toast for change. The change in my life is this, I'm going to graduate high school without becoming pregnant. Uh, another young man says, who was a gang member, says, the change in my life is that I am going to live to be 18. And then one man says, can I read from my journal that you've asked me to, read, to write? And this is what he writes. Ms. G, can I read something from my diary? That'd be great. Who is he? Man, he's been with us since freshman year, fool. What's his name? I don't know. The summer was the worst summer in my short 14 years of life. It all started with a phone call. My mother was crying and begging, asking for more time. I said she were gasping for her last breath of air. She held me as tight as she could and cried. Her tears hit my shirt like bullets and told me we were being evicted. She kept apologizing to me. I thought I have no home. I should have asked for something less expensive at Christmas. On the morning of the eviction, a hard knock on the door woke me up. The sheriff was there to do his job. I looked up by the sky, waiting for something to happen. My mother has no family to lean on, no money coming in. Why bother coming to school or getting good grades if I'm homeless? The bus stops in front of the school. I feel like throwing up. I'm wearing clothes from last year, some old shoes and no new haircut. I kept thinking I'd get laughed at. Instead, I'm greeted by a couple of friends who were in my English class last year. And it hits me, Mrs. Gruwell, my crazy English teacher from last year, is the only person that made me think of hope. Talking with friends about last year's English and our trips, I began to feel better. I received my schedule and the first teacher is Mrs. Gruwell in room 203. I walk into the room and feel as though all the problems in life are not so important anymore. I am home. As we do an invitation this morning, we're not inviting you to a place. We're not inviting you to a meeting. We're inviting you to come home. A lot of different people, a lot of different backgrounds, and we all got our stuff. If you're intimidated by the people who are in the pews, I, I want to sing the third verse of Just As I Ain't. Just as I ain't, we're messed up too. Forgive us the times this fact seemed new. If we've acted perfect, it's just not true. It's by His grace we become. Wherever you are, and whatever's going on with you, I just want to let you know, you can come home. There is a place where people love you and accept you for whoever you are. That's this place. That's what the real church is all about.
If you're someone who's never begun your journey with Jesus by being buried in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life, I hope you'll do that. And for everybody else, make it one of your goals in life to continue looking outward so that this place will become a place where people can hear a big story about a big God who has a big love for everybody. This invitation is to let you know that church is not for just church people. Church is for everybody. So if we can serve you, we want to. While we stand, while we sing, to encourage you. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the 